Hello everyone, this is Adam Kahlo, and you're listening to Landscapes. In case you haven't already figured it out, this podcast is really a parallel project to my other job, which is teaching environmental governance and politics at a university. Recently, I've been giving some talks about one of the central themes of this podcast, which is to say that promising visions for sustainability are very welcome, but if we don't generate significantly new land relations to match these designs, then ideas for a green future might forever live in the sketchbook instead of as a policy. And after these talks, there's inevitably a response that goes something like this. If you are so interested in building new ways of relating to land, you should go study peoples and cultures that don't operate under the strong ownership model of private property. They have already figured it out. This comment is mostly correct. The whole power of property is that if you grow up dancing to its tune, It seems unfathomable that we can organize our society any other way. Taking a glance into institutions and cultures that manage land from a vastly different set of organizing principles and assumptions is indeed an experience that proves there is nothing natural about private property. But what's the next step? I don't think we are talking about a project of mere translation here, where we say the cultural commons management practices of a small-scale fishery out there can be overlaid atop the layered legal and social practices of the ownership model that dominates the West and is exported elsewhere. As Nicholas Balmley remarks, a group of neighbors can, of course, today, knock down their fences and manage the newly linked backyards as a common landscape with a unique and original set of rules for use and access. But the state-backed power of private property is always there, lurking, to take all that away in an instant. So instead of a project of translating known alternative ways to govern land, I think this is a project of unwinding or unraveling, peeling back the many layers that entrench property. And for this, I think we need to draw on examples emerging out of the core rather than the periphery. I'm interested in people and institutions that are trying to unravel the power of property in places where property, not land, is sacred. I'm interested in seeing what techniques are clever enough to build a new way of land relations surrounded by cultural and legal signals that say this is, in fact, impossible. Today's episode is an interview with Dido van Oosten, a co-founder of Stichting Kapsteloos Seyn, a project in the Netherlands that attempts to acquire land for agroecological production surrounded literally by industrial farming. Of course, Kapsteloos Seyn is inspired by the distant examples of durable commons management, but the types of legal innovations they use the way they frame their project, the allies they forge, the forces that they are grappling with that threaten the project's long-term success, these are the lessons I think should be highlighted in order to build the type of land politics to run parallel to the emerging green agenda. Here is Dito van Oosten of Capitalo Sein. My name is Dido and I'm a co-founder of Stichting Capitalo Seen and mainly a farmer in the Netherlands. What is farming like in the Netherlands? That's a good question. Uh, the, the first thing I think about is like already I think like the main topic that we're going to talk about today is access to land. That it's very difficult. There's uh, maybe the highest land prices in the world are here. So I think... On average, you pay like 75,000 euros an hectare. And that translates into like, uh, yeah, that this country is mainly uh, monoculture based. There's loads of green fields for cows, um, which, yeah, you could say it's a green desert. And over the over the past years, uh, I would say like the, the past maybe 70 years, like the amount of farmers really decreased immensely. And the, the land... The amount of land per farmer increased a lot. So you're painting this picture of a green desert, highly productive, few farmers, really expensive. But all these things are related. How did it get this way? They got this way... Well, it started, I think, just after the Second World War. Uh, There was this uh, minister in the Netherlands called Manshold. There was a lot of hunger, of course. In, in the war. So they, they wanted to have a very productive way of farming. So people weren't hungry anymore. I would say the driving factors behind the, the agricultural situation in the Netherlands at the moment yeah, was mainly indeed high productivity. Every farmer had to grow to survive. If you were a small farmer, you just couldn't survive. So they, they disappeared anyway, mm, which meant that 
yeah, farmers were getting bigger and bigger. And also that agricultural land is, is, like an, is still part of the market. It's not regulated. So it's also a very good investment. Yeah, so there's also a lot of speculation there. Yeah, and for example, the last 10 years already, the land price has doubled. And so are these farmers then super profitable if the land is valued so high? Or is it really being valued because of the speculative interest? Uh, yeah, that, that's it. It's, I, th I think it doesn't have so much to do anymore with the value of, for example, vegetables or milk or that you can get from the land. It's rather separated from that. Uh, it's just too expensive. Yeah. And uh, the thing is that uh, the bank, the Rabobank in the Netherlands, it's like the farmer's bank, has a huge influence um, well, to create this ex access to land. So if, if you need money to buy land, for example, you go to this bank and they really want a growth-based, like economical growth-based uh, business plan, I would say, which means like uh, the use of artificial fertilizer a lot and pesticides. So if you, if you want to go into organic farming and you need money, then the, the bank will not give it to you. So that's like one side. And the other side is like the supermarkets that, that ask really low prices. So farmers are a bit stuck in between, I would say. Like on the one side, the high land prices and the bank that only gives money. If you use the land extremely productive, well, productive in a very narrow meaning of that. And on the, the other hand, the supermarkets. So it's very, it's very difficult in, in, in this country to farm in a different way. Uh, but, um, well, there are some helpful projects coming up also. Yeah, that leads to kind of your story. You describe this farming landscape, but you don't necessarily live in that world. What, what was your personal path into farming? My personal path? Well, it is quite a story. Well, a story, just... I, I, was, I was born in the city and my parents didn't farm at all or like, like there was no family members doing it and I first studied climate science and geology and I, re I mainly liked the field work so I felt I was already like hmm I, th I think I want to work outside that's the thing and not only behind the computer um, then I went to nautical college I went to, to sailing which was like very nice and outside and I, I once made this very long trip to the Caribbean with a good friend, with on a sailing cargo ship, with with many friend, people, but like with one good friend, which was actually a farmer. And on every island we we came, he was like, "Ah, oh, now let's go to the, let, let's have a look, let's have a look at, at this garden and at this garden." So I think he sort of inspired me, like ah. And I was looking for like, what do I want to do, which is outside but also political so that's like in short sort of my personal like then i decided i i want to go to farming school and see what happens but you didn't go to a farming school that that was you know industrial livestock production yeah there's this one one farming school it's called the warmonderhof uh it's like a biodynamic farming school it's quite small and like a very nice people doing the school and still, well, yeah, that, that was really nice. And there, and there we got to know a bit like the community around uh, alternative farming, I would say. And, the, and there we also, like I asked my, my, my friend David, who was also my neighbor by then, to join me just sort of for, as a joke. And, but he, he did it. He, he really liked it. He liked the idea. So we went there together with both different backgrounds. Um, but already like together we were joining climate uh, activists or well in general just protests a lot and thinking about how to change the world I would say or how to get out of this capitalist reality and and then yeah in, in the farming school it was all about the practice of farming but how to get access to land for example or more political questions were, weren't really a thing but we did see a lot of young people that wanted to go into farming and like a loads of enthusiasm. But in reality, we only saw monoculture when we drove to the landscape. Well, we started thinking what to do about it. Yeah, you described this powerful image of young people 
wanting to change, but being taught kind of technical practices. And that's the main criticism of the food movement is a practice only, a technology only. But so you were always at the beginning weaving climate politics with with agriculture. Can you explain that to me? Well, the way most of the farmers or industrial farmers farm at the moment is, well, disastrous, I would say, for the, for the climate and the biodiversity um, crisis. It's really part of it. It's very, uh, well, for example, the artificial fertilizer and the pesticides are, are like huge destroy, destroyers uh, and the fossil fuel based way of farming it's really a, yeah, an industry rather than uh, working together with nature or with the landscape. And well, yeah, and and then this alternative group of farmers, which is it's really hopeful in a way because I think if if I have it right, uh, like fifteen years ago there were only maybe five. Now I'm talking about CSA farmers, so like not per se biological farmers who still could have monocultures, but do it in a different way, which already is a big difference. But like the group of CSA farmers, like community-supported agriculture, it's very small-scale, direct chain, so they sell directly to to the community around them. I I think the past 15 years, if I have it right, they grow with, they started with five or so, and now it's already 300. So it's like a huge... um, well, it's not it's not a big group yet, but it's growing very fast. And one of the reasons well, for for them or for us, I could say, m- most of them farm on like a, a piece of land of maybe half a hectare or one hectare or maybe two hectares, which is relatively very small. But it's also easier to get access to because it's not so expensive. But yeah, if you then think of of industrial farmers that own or or rent on average 40 hectares. But there are many farmers that, that have like around 100 or maybe even 1,000. And then this, this little group of 300 farmers with their one hectare plots. Yeah, like in the landscape, it's not very visible, I would say. Yeah, so you highlight this, this disconnect between a growing movement of people on the one hand, but they still can't get enough land to make a meaningful difference. Indeed, like in the in the landscape as a whole, yeah, it's just tiny dots. Um, so, I, yeah, I, I, I would say, yes, the amount of, of CSA farmers should grow, but especially the amount of land that they have or that they have access to should be way bigger, way bigger than this one hectare. And this is also for us, like, it was an inspiration to to, well, to start with Capital Hussein, like, sort of this, like, urgency of, come on, we should grow and in yes, amount, but that's, I think, not so difficult because there are so many people that want to go into farming. But mainly, it, we should take more space. Like, it's fun, it's fun, right? Also, as like in feminism, it's a thing like women should take more space or, or queers, or, but it's always with the, yeah, and, and with this, it's the same, like, sort of fi- fight ourselves into the, the status quo. I wanted to ask you one more question about the farmer school. On the one hand, just focusing on biodynamic practices, for example, doesn't bring that politics and it therefore doesn't address the kind of root causes of the problem. But in the same time, maybe it brought the inspiration for you to join agriculture in the first place. What do you make of these types of training programs or these kind of technocratic solutions for new farmers that don't get to the land problem. Yeah, I think it would be very nice and important, like it's to, yeah, that farmer schools also give some time and space to these questions. Because, yeah, when you when you finish school and you want to start farming, yeah, how, how do you get access or what are the possibilities? Or actually, I think it would be very nice if in these schools also like students start to organize themselves to maybe fight these problems but yeah because i i also think with with biodynamic farming for example like access to land is really the core thing like if farmers have access to cheap and like maybe yeah quite a lot so not to half a hectare but maybe 10 hectares of land without the like insane financial pressure that's on it now 
then like these practices the biodynamic practice but mainly like maybe food forests or like i think then if the space is there with that without this money thing but i think yeah access to land is really one of the of the most important things and so you came to this conclusion that access to land was the core of this issue what is the underlying drive of the unequitable land access in your opinion to survive as a industrial farmer you have to grow all the time which means that there is a big like yeah a lot of farmers want to have more land which goes together that with the fact that many farmers have to quit because they cannot survive anymore yeah and and so if if, if a farmer is quitting then the neighbors will buy the land probably and it will not be on the market even uh, so that that's one thing like with the access to land problem mm, but mainly like that land is like it's 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 a mark it's in the market so it's a very good investment and especially when it's close to the city and and the zoning plans might change from agricultural land to urban like some that yeah, people buy the land to sort of speculate yeah i think those things are quite underlying drivers yeah as an outsider i've noticed that the, on the pressure on housing to really distorts these land markets i can't imagine any open land out competing this hunger for housing yeah exactly yeah 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 so people know that probably cities are going to grow uh, and agricultural land is going to use for that so if you buy some land close to a city it's a great investment yeah uh, that's true yeah and indeed yeah it's it's a sort of a it's quite a tiny country we have so a lot of agricultural land is close to villages or cities so you highlighted two key underlying drivers of the problem the need for growth and how that is attached to the financial support to access land and the other is that land is just a marketable commodity how did you address these problems in your foundation yeah so uh mainly well the big thing to start with like when you when you when you need land and you want to buy it or you want to have some well i will talk about it later maybe um yeah we you need money right so we we started we thought oh maybe we can play uh for bank <laughs> because all these young idealist farmers will not get access to money, so also not to land because of the existing banks. So we started a foundation, yeah, Foundation Capital Ocean. And with this foundation, we, uh, well, we want to organize money, collect it, uh, donations. But yeah, in practice, if you if you need like 400 or 500,000 euros only in donations, it's really not easy. So we thought, uh, let's do um, l- loans int- and then interest-free loans. So we asked, for example, for the, for the first um, piece of land, uh, there's 40 people that supported the, the foundation. So 40 people that, that uh, lend us like a certain amount of money. Uh, and then with that money, we can buy land. So that's, yeah, that's like the first, the the basic thing. And uh, the thing is like the people will not just give us money, of course, to buy land for whatever thing. So we, we, we made some, uh, like a nice story and also what we want to, what we really want to do. So yeah, so access to land is, is very difficult for idealist farmers, but also for non-humans. For non-human life, especially with all the pesticides and also pressure on land and nature, well, there, there's just not so much land where they can live. So we, we thought, oh, we make some rules that 50% of the land is not for, for human use. So it's just a nice place for non-human life to, to hang out, to make babies, to play around. And 10% of the land is for humans. Which is which could mean an ecological garden, like a CSA garden, where a farmer also could could get um, an income from, and then the rest of the space, like forty percent, um, is a shared space between humans and non-humans. And this is quite it feels like maybe it sounds quite rigid, like sort of oh, uh, all the rules, but yeah, it's just to make sure that well, it's it's actually an attempt or an, or an experiment to live together as a hum- as humans with non-human life or to also make space for others um, so that that sort of and, and and no use of pesticides and artificial fertilizer of course 
and, and this also comes back like where, what I just talked about with the scale that CSA farms, uh, most of them have like half a hectare or one hectare and we should become bigger. Like in this vision, the 10% is like a CSA farm, which, which could be one hectare or a half hectare. And the rest, for example, the 40% of food forest and, and the um, space for other life. So instead of half a hectare, we have almost five hectares with the, the first piece of land that we bought. Yeah, which already is not like as an average farmer, but it's, it's, it's already 10 times bigger. And so that's also an important thing that we want to do. And the land that we buy, so this was the first piece of land with, where we are farmers ourselves, but we hope to buy another piece of land this year, maybe another next year. Um, we we yeah, buy it out of the market. That's the, the idea. So it's never going to be sold again, which also means, so if you plant trees or like slowly an ecosystem will, yeah, will be there and become more complex over the time that everyone can stay, although a farmer is retiring or wants to stop. So we, we really try that, that it's not going to be sold ever. That would be great. And that gets at the issue of growth, right? If there's no expected future sale of the land, that allows for a changing idea of what the land could be used for. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like it's a, a, I can imagine as a farmer, there are different motivations coming with that, that it's never going to be sold. And, um, and also... I think what is important to say is that because the inter- because the loans that Stichty Capital is saying gets are interest free, uh, so if people lend us their capital, it will not accumulate. Uh, that also means that the farmers don't have to pay any rent for the land. Like they don't pay anything for it, like the birds or like other animals that live there. Like it's, yeah. Because they live together. So you said about the land, the cost of land is prohibitive for many farmers. But why can't they just rent? Beginning farmers, small farmers, shouldn't they be able to rent land to get started? Yeah, that, that's actually what many farmers do. There is a there is a market for that. Um, but the thing with that is, for example, in France and Belgium, you have like quite long term contracts, so you know as a farmer that you can farm there for for example at least 16 years or maybe even your whole life Uh, but here in the netherlands it used to be like that but they changed it like in the housing markets and like yeah well in in all kinds of um areas they changed it into like they really are stimulating short-term contracts uh, so these contracts are maybe for one year or sometimes for two years, if you're lucky, five years. Uh, but like for farmers, especially for agriculture or like uh, agroecology farmers, um, like soil life is extremely important. The way we farm is like building up a nice, like a very living soil and it takes time. And if, if the soil is very alive, then like it, it every time goes better. Uh, there's, there's less um, pests coming through, for example. So if you, only, if you don't know how long you can stay, then yeah, it, it, it feels weird to farm in this way. And especially when you talk about planting trees or like have, have sort of an agro um, forestry system. Yeah, it's very demotivating. So that that's also I, I hope they like also talking about policy, they should change that very soon because renting is quite an okay. Uh, well, there yeah I know a lot of CSA farmers that rent, maybe most of them even. So that that's that's a very important thing that should uh, that should change. So you do all this legal complexity. How does it work? There's one site now. There's some plan. What happens there? What's going on? What does it look like? Yeah, so it is, um, it's a plot of land of four and a half hectares. Um, it's like one hour drive from, from Amsterdam to the east. Uh, and um, we are now with four farmers. And we all work three days a week. And that's also, we really don't want to change that. I think we are also... Uh, I'll think that maybe everyone should just work three days a week and not more than that. Um, we work three days a week and we, so 
a little part of the land is the is the vegetable garden. It's in the middle. It's a very long and small piece of land. And there used to be, uh, there are already f- quite a lot of cherry trees, a few thousand even, and plum trees. And they are like with a lot of plastic and steel, and they're maybe one meter from each other. So that's like the starting point that we had was like an industrial farm. So we have been cleaning over the past two, two years a lot to make space to plant like an agroforestry system. Um, and also to make like, um, yeah, sort of a, a capitalist ruin that we started with. And it would be nice to make it into a nice place for uh, other life as well. But we, we started as a self-harvesting garden. So we hoped that people from the neighborhood would come and harvest themselves. It's a very nice model. It saves up some work and people feel very connected to the land because they come there a lot. But we were like, our situation is that there's another garden like that, just like two kilometers away or something. Um, And she was still looking for people. So we had to change our model. So now we bring, uh, like we make vegetable bags every week, like with all kinds of vegetables and fruit and herbs. Um... And it's both for people in the neighborhood, but we also drive back to Amsterdam where we all live. Uh, when we work on the land, we sleep there, but in the weekend or in the, four, the four other days, we are in Amsterdam. And here it's very easy. Like we asked around and many people were interested. Um, and we're going to buy an electric van to transport that. And what is also very nice and what's also part of the, like the alternative farming community in the Netherlands, at least, and the, it's, it's also, the inspiration is coming from Germany, I think. It's like we, we um, work with social, uh, social payment. So when someone is not earning a lot, the vegetables are very cheap. When someone is earning a lot, it's very expensive and everything in between. So we... It's also not the question, what do you think this cucumber uh, costs or what do, you want, what, what do you want to pay for this? But we connect our labor to the labor of the, of the, the people that eat our vegetables. So we calculate that we, yeah, uh, we work around one hour per week per person for their food so they can decide what we earn per hour or what they pay per week with their own wage, like as a indicator. And that's also really nice. So the food is, is also ex- like accessible, not only for rich people. Uh, with, uh, now like organic food is only accessible. It's, it's just very expensive in the store. So it also means when you are at minimum wage or don't have a job, you can eat like extremely organic and nice food. We really enjoy this. And we also have a little store at the the street and there we do the same. Like per product, you can choose between four prices, Um, like under minimum, minimum, uh, like average and above average or something. And it's really nice, people all, everyone understands it quite well and people start to think about yeah it's just also a different way of thinking and quite logical I would say and so one of the terms you used to describe this model was collective non-ownership. What does this mean? And why is that important to bring what Capitalo is saying is doing against ownership? Yeah, what's wrong with owning the land? If, if, if land is privately owned and the farmer does all kinds of nice things on the land but sells it again after 40 years and then maybe 
to an agri an industrial farmer uh, that yeah then like the ecosystem gets lost but in general like that land is owned by private people it seems that it has a very destructive influence on what happens on the land uh, so yeah yeah we we are a big fan of of, of uh, collective ownership and especially collective non-ownership so it's the land is from no one or everyone but mainly no one uh, it also means like if if land is really from someone and someone has the right to extract things from the land to extract uh, nutrients to kill everyone that's living on it and when it's not owned by anyone like everyone has the responsibility of take care of to take care of it mm. but to create a legal structure in this can country yeah well this country where private property is quite sacred i would say it's it's not so easy like there's not yeah a law or a or a legal structure we could just use to make to make it of no one uh, so we may, that, well we try to make this structure bit based on the Miethauser Syndicat, that is like a German housing organization, to try, yeah, to sort of try to make it this way. And I think other other organizations do do it differently. And the reason why you need to do this legal structure, because without it, if you just say we all own this, we all take care of this, the legal preference for individual ownership is always a threat to that common ownership. If you just figure out the informal rules of how to relate to each other and non-human nature and take care of a piece of land without also creating some legal tools, then this commons you've created could be defeated by the law's favor towards individual ownership. We, we, we really want to, to create this legal structure to, well, that it's safe, that it's safe from a future person that in a private ownership situation will treat the land differently or will maybe sell it to make money or whatever interest. So we, we make this legal structure so that, yeah, it, it's, it's safe, well, as safe as possible. Like it's an attempt to, to keep it for the future. And how does this housing syndicate work and how did you apply it to the Netherlands and to farmland? Yeah. So. This Miethauser Syndicat um, organization, like that's an umbrella organization uh, and they, well, they, yeah, it's German and they mainly buy houses or like that's their, that's their project. And every project, sort of a company, well, every, every housing project is independent and they are organized in a certain uh, legal structure. And like the resident association is responsible, responsible for all the day-to-day -day management things and the Miethauser Syndicate only has something to say about like the selling of the houses. Uh, they have kind of a veto on, on changes like in the articles of association. Like like this they sort of like when the uh, the local association or like the people, the resident association, if they want to sell the house, the Miethauser Syndicate will say no no no. That's not possible. So that's sort of, um, yeah, to keep it, that the, the houses never can be sold again. And it's, so, it's turned into social housing, sort of, yeah, collector, collective ownership. Uh, and, and all the, the people that live there are autonomous. But this umbrella organization is there to, yeah, to make sure it's never, it's never sold and it goes in the right way. Um, yeah, and that was quite inspiring. There's also this Dutch housing uh, foundation that's, that started to work like this, which is, is called Vrijkoop. Um, so they also like buy houses out of the market and make it accessible for uh, low income renters. But they, but but these renters have uh, also feel very responsible for that. Yeah, we thought it was quite inspiring. So what we do is that Stichting Kapitale Seen is the yeah the umbrella organization of the land that there is now and also the future land that we're gonna buy and. Yeah, Sigrun Kapitalisten has all the, like also the legal structure to, uh, for example, an ANBI status and a bank account. They, they, the, the goal is that they organize money. And then with every land that is bought, an association is started. And this association will be the owner of the land. And this association has two members, Sigrun Kapitalisten and the farmer company. So for example, two or three farmers start to farm on this land. They will have a little company or association to sell their vegetables. So they're both members of the 
of this association that owns the land. And then again, like Stichting Capital is saying, it's 51% well, yeah, of the, it's the membership and uh, and the farmers company 49, but it actually just means that um, the farmers are very autonomous. They do what they do, uh, what they want to do. There's only these this, this rules that you, 10% of the land is, f- is for humans and 40% for like a shared space and 50% for non-humans. So like in daily life for the farmers, like they are very autonomous and decide themselves what they do. Uh, but if it's got like questions like about selling the land or changing things in the legal structure, for example, Capital Hussein always have to vote and they have a bit more power, I would say, like when it comes to selling. And in the in the articles, articles of association, if that's the word, like the of Capital is saying, it said that the land is never going to be sold. So it, yeah, in that way, we try to sort of that it's safe for the future and that it's it's owned by this by this association. But who's this association? It's the farmers, but they cannot sell it. It's the it's Capital is saying, but they cannot sell it. So that's how we try to make a legal structure that achieves collective non ownership as good as possible. And and also and also like we really try. So it it, it changes also the the reality. Like it's the question is not who. Is is the owner of this land it rather is who has access to what and under what conditions that now is the most like the more important question yeah it's it's this association but that's not really someone like it's it's not so it's just not important anymore uh, the farmers has, have access to the land to the land but but under the conditions that capital is saying stated so the that there's also a lot of access for non-human life yeah, so if the association can't be approached, as would an individual farmer from some kind of realtor with a deal to sell out. Exactly. Like even if if, if like a municipality has a great deal, uh, the farmer can, farmers will not be like they cannot sell it, uh, not on their own at least. And Capital Hussein will say, yeah, we will never sell it. That's the thing. Yeah. So there's no... Yeah, financial, like any financial benefits. I've heard you describe these types of legal tools that set up Capital Hussein as a trick. Why is this a trick? Who is being fooled? And why do we need such craftiness to get to the land access needed for agroecological production? Yeah, it's also in a way, it it feels a bit like a trick, like it's a sort of, yeah, anti-property project or like, at least private property, but we still are in the system that we live in, where property is holy or sacred and where land is very expensive. And we actually use quite some, yeah, I would say tricks, for example, um, that we use that this association, well, this legal structure that we build uh, in the world, yeah, it's still like there's still ownership um, in the eyes of others, of a municipality, for example. And this, yeah, we we use this ownership or this property thing, like to, it's it's the safest way to keep land for a long time. There's no, you don't you do not rent it from someone or or from a municipality that can change so in fifty years or in five years. So that's that's maybe one of the like tricks to actually use property in a different way <laughs> yeah and we also use this trick like just like lend money from people put it in an, into an anti-capitalist project yeah that's also what big companies do all the time right having their shareholders although our shareholders are not really shareholders because they don't have anything to say is there some kind of policy change that would make this model more scalable or not such a hassle well this model when you talk about uh, like having a, a little csa farm and the food forest around i think if there would be any policy change that would make land more accessible and more cheap then then this would be like very scalable uh, but then that, that's only the, the the land use i would say because I, I really believe if someone um, that now every CSA farmer now put on their half hectare or one hectare, if you give them 10 times more land, a lot of them will probably just plant trees and shrubs and like a food forest system. Um, so if this, this, this part of the model, um, yeah, would just would be very scalable with better access to land. 
and well then now we made this this uh, legal structure to to create sort of a collective non-ownership it would be very nice if there's like a simple way of doing that that there will be a policy and also like recognized um by politicians but also that the, the the idea of not owning something like that owning a house or owning land is not better than just having access to it this whole idea and we've been like now it's like people find it really weird that we don't want to own the land ourselves just in general like a very a tiny niche really understands it um so if there would be a policy change that may, will make it a little more easy, but also, yeah, that people are going to talk about it in a different way. One of the criticisms here that you might find is that because the business of farming is so poor, a lot of farmers are counting on that future land sale in order to feel secure, in order to retire. Even if you own land and your business isn't doing great, you can still apply for lines of credit. It gives you status in society and many other things of the benefits of that property relation. How do farmers in this system of non-ownership secure their future if they can't sell that land one day? It's a very good question. It's also, uh, yeah, there are now a few organizations doing it. And, and I think it's a big experiment and no one is, is there yet that, uh, that the farmer wants to retire, for example. Um, but I, yeah, we could, we are can definitely going to think of, of uh, systems like the, the like a first important thing would be that farmers just get, uh, get like nicely paid for their products, so then then they can make a pension themselves, for example. Or that, or we could also think of. Um, like we now work on this land, we put a lot of effort and we plant trees. That if we retire, for example, that the, I think I think there's an organization doing that, that the next farmers that work on the land will also um, pay a little bit to the previous farmers so that they can live. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's a good question. Like I, now, now farmers are are indeed like cash poor, and uh, uh, but they have like this land that they can sell. So they're most of them are millionaires, which is crazy. <laughs> um, yeah, we we have to think. We have to think of this. Yeah, and maybe recognize that the current model of millionaires who are waiting for that day, but day to day are really stressed buying inputs is also not ideal no no definitely not no and if there's less financial financial pressure in the moment you can just relax and, and if your rent of the house is like it's also a system change you know like i think it's now it's all also in the housing market like people everyone is screaming like yeah, i should buy a house because that's the only way to to uh, like have a nice like have a nice retirement or at least it's safe or just give some security um but yeah yeah it, it's more and more the the truth in a way because this neoliberal politics um is really like fucking up <laughs> i'm sorry for my words like the the rent the renting um yeah the how the, the, the houses that you can rent um, so everything has to do with with each other. Like it should be normal to not own everything again. Yeah, like a, a lot of things should change. If if your rent is not so high, you can just stay in the house where you where you are, and you don't need a lot of money. Yeah. So this question of systems change brings me thinking back to this workshop we had where there was a bunch of kind of property law people and Dutch alternative food people. And something that impressed me was kind of like 
each group had a different vision of how to solve this land access problem. Some that were quite reformist and some that were a little bit more systems change. For example, we heard from a law professor who talked about how maybe new case law in the environment might force a reckoning with some of these norms of property in Europe. Another idea was maybe the, the land venons model, where kind of private investment with a small return gets funneled into ownership structures, and then farmers are given favorable leases if they deliver sustainable practices. And then a final idea was, well, what if we just go to the industrial farmers and get a 2% of their land for alternative production and just convince them to change practices? And then maybe, you know, you represent more of the systems change perspective challenging the very nature of property itself with what are tools you have lying around. Why do you think there's this variety of opinions about how to, to face this land access problem? And where do you sit? You know, can, can property be reformed? Or is that some kind of social or legal revolution must be brought against it? Well, I think also many of these solutions can go hand in hand. Like, I think it's quite nice that different organizations do it in a different way. And also we don't claim that the, the way we do it is like the, the way to go. Um, but it's, I, I would say it's a bit more, it's mere, a bit more on the radical side or a bit more of the system change. Um, and not just like, uh, we go on with the, th with, yeah, with how things work, but we just change it a bit. Like we, we already tried it for, for decades, I imagine, but it doesn't really work. Uh, yeah, so, and I, I, yeah, I also think it's already quite nice. Yeah, we are for system change, but we also managed to do it like on a very tiny scale already in this, in this, um, system that's, that's there that we of course want to change. Um, yeah. And the, the Land van ons model, for example, that people can invest um, and they can sell it again. Yeah, I don't know. You're not a big fan of that. And also that the farmer there is not the number one. It's like they're, they're not really autonomous. Still, the people that invest money can decide what happens. So again, like what's already happening in the world all the time, people with capital or with money are the ones that have power, the ones that say, how things should look like. And yeah, if, if you have a lot of money, you have a different view on things because you, most of the time, the people want to get more money with it again. So that's, yeah, that, that's really part of the system we are in now, this growth-based uh, way of thinking and organizing. Uh, so in that sense, um, yeah, I think we are on the system change side indeed. That we have to, yeah, also this, this power um, shouldn't be at the people that have money or that own things. It should be, yeah, it should be like we have a right for food, a right for housing. And that's where the power lies, use over ownership. Thank you for that. In uh, my research, one of the crit criticisms I get and others get about agroecology and alternative food production models is people say, well, where's the labor going to come from? If you replace these intensive inputs or mechanization to some extent, you're going to drastically need a lot of new labor. And maybe that's okay to some extent. But I often suggest in my research that if that pressure of the land market was removed from the picture maybe alternative farming wouldn't be such a hustle. Maybe it's just one of the options for the farmers to focus on amongst the diversity of values they could use the land for. What is life like on the farm now under the non-ownership of this capital of saying concept? Well, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun, <laughs> I will say. It's really... Um... Yeah, we see, we, we are like, we have this plot of land of almost five hectares. Uh, it used to be an industrial uh, fruit, like strawberry farm, strawberry and cherries and plums. Um, so we've been removing a lot of steel and plastic over the past years. 
and we started this this garden and we now feed like maybe 80 to 100 people this year that's the plan and we are with four so we actually do, we have a lot of fun and it's very relaxed and we are yeah we see we see our neighbor farming farmers they own quite a lot of land with big machines they are they are always on their own on their tractors while we are having a tea together um and it's also a lot of work physical work of course but that, like it's it's also not that we that we go back to the 1850s or something of course more labor is needed which i don't think is a big problem if if we would need it like directly maybe but if you would yeah i think there's many people that would like to work for example two days a week on a farm i do really believe that um but there's also electrical tools for example like there's new innovations for small scale farms that really help and that make work a bit more light or that we don't need too much people um but i would i would recommend everyone to to start farming actually and we just planted uh, many trees so there's also this yeah we grow the vegetables uh, which is every year sort of the same. We started two years ago, so it's all quite new also. And then, um, um, yeah, with the layer of planting trees and shrubs, like it, we can harvest from them maybe in five or ten years. There's this other layer in time. Yeah, which is just really nice and so nice to take care, to take care of the land to make it beautiful and to see um yeah see wildlife well wildlife is maybe a big word <laughs> uh, but yeah the bees and the butterflies and insects and deers and slowly coming back it's it's really it's really a hopeful kind of work especially uh yeah we we came from this or we are still like sometimes blocking or uh, industrial, well, yeah, or like like we are also activists, which is quite uh, tiring sometimes and always against a system and of and yeah sometimes things change but it goes really slow and and farming is so nice and hopeful and, and we create a sort of very tiny but still we create a an alternative economy an alternative place where things are in a way that we like it well dito with that vision i think that's a great place to end thanks for talking about land land access and sharing with your intervention here thank you for uh, yeah, for the nice interview. Yeah, if if people are around or live in the Netherlands, everyone should come by. Everyone is welcome <laughs> to see what happens there. That's it for this episode of Landscapes. Thanks for listening. Thanks again to Dido for her time coming to the workshop a few months ago and also to sitting down and recording an interview. You can find a written transcript of the entire episode at adamkalo.substack.com where I write a newsletter about land and food issues. You can also get in touch. I'd love to hear your feedback. All of the papers and cases that we mentioned you can find in the show notes. This episode received production support from Tessa Ravistan. This episode was supported by the Radboud Glasgow University Collaboration Fund. <laughs>